Okay, so thinking back to last class period, we were talking about proteins and um, things like what proteins do for us, which we said, basically, if something's getting done in the body, good chance of proteins doing it, okay? Um, listed here are the six functional types of proteins included at the very bottom. And this is the last thing we were talking about the other day were the catalytic proteins called enzymes, okay? So we talked about how enzymes work as far as lowering the activation energy. I just wanna kind of talk a little bit more about them. We got a couple more slides on them. Enzymes consist of two parts, a protein portion called the apoenzyme, but it's not entirely protein. It's also got a non-protein portion called cofactor. The cofactor may be a metal ion like iron, magnesium, zinc, or calcium, or it could just be an organic molecule called what we'll call coenzyme, usually derived from vitamins. So thinking about, you know, like a healthy diet, it's not just going to be a diet with proteins, carbs, and lipids. It's also going to have lots and lots of vitamins and minerals, which, you know, thinking like fruits and vegetables have lots of minerals and vitamins. A lot of um, cereals are fortified. And so, um, especially the good types, not like the Lucky Charms and Fruit Loops style. If you're going to eat it, um, a good meal in the breakfast or for breakfast, you'll get some of those good vitamins that you need. Okay. And enzymes, um, as far as their name goes, usually end with the suffix ace, like you can see here with all these at the bottom, oxidases, kinases, proteases, etc. Okay. There are still a few enzymes that will cover this semester that have an older name, pepsin, renin, and trypsin. Um, I don't know why they don't have the kind of updated version of the name, but um, we'll talk about those at various points in the semester. Uh, enzymes can be grouped into um, categories based on the type of chemical reaction that they catalyze. And these are things I'm gonna ask you to know for the exam, but I wanna kind of introduce them. Dehydrogenases remove hydrogens from something, oxidases add oxygen, kinases add a phosphate, ATPases split ATP, and hydrases remove water. Proteases break down proteins, lipases break down triglycerides. Um, like I said, I'm not going to ask you to know what each of those does. Um, we're not going to talk specifics about those a uh, whole, whole lot. I mean, like later in the semester, we'll talk about like um, uh, gastric lipase, for example, your stomach releases that enzyme to help break down your fats that we've eaten. Um, we'll talk about like ATPases. Uh, um, different points in the semester, kinases a little bit. So you'll see some of those words again, some of them really not so much. All right, now enzymes can be said to work kind of like a lock and a key work, okay? What we call a lock and key mechanism describes a relationship that a enzyme has, like this enzyme here, sucrase, with a substrate, in this case, sucrose. Suc sucrose is the substrate, sucrase is the enzyme, ASE, remember, is the enzyme. A, a substrate is just the molecule that's um, being reacted upon by the enzyme, okay? Well, if you think like a lock and a key, we all have keys, whether that's you know to your vehicle or to your house or whatever, and I've got like 10 different keys because I've got multiple offices, I've got three vehicles between me and my wife, and uh, so I've got lots of keys and, you know, I, I take my key out um, and it has a unique shape and it's going to fit nice and perfectly in with the, the door or the ignition for whatever, you know, that lock is. And it's not like I can stick my car key in to my house and expect it to uh, open it up. Okay. Enzymes and substrates are very specific for one another. Okay. So that's what I mean when I say that they are only going to react with one another like sucrase and sucrose and a lot of times it's named very nicely like this okay um, it's all about the shape of the substrate and what we call the active site the active site is the, the space within the enzyme where that substrate fits and what's actually really cool in some cases when that substrate bonds and forms what we call an enzyme substrate complex the active site kind of closes in on it and kind of snugs uh, things up a little bit we call that induced fit Okay, now once that docking of the substrate to the enzyme occurs, then the chemical reaction could take place and that can form um, entirely new products. In this case, we take that sucrose and we actually break it apart. So this is a decomposition reaction where we've now formed glucose and fructose, which can be released 
and the enzyme itself is ready to do the process all over again. We said one of the key features of a enzyme and a catalyst is that it's not itself changed at the end of the reaction. Okay, and that's why you can see it's drawn like a cycle of events or a series of events where we're constantly doing the exact same thing over and over again. And think of it just like a key, you know, you stick it in the door lock, you unlock the door, that key's not ruined forever and you have to get a brand new key. Enzymes last for periods of time and not forever, um, but they can survive, you know, more than one round of a chemical reaction. Okay. Last thing here on enzymes, and this will wrap us up on proteins. The activity of an enzyme can be influenced here. I've got four things listed. The first we'll talk about is the temperature and pH of the solution, which relates to that process of denaturation that I talked about the other day. If you remember my um, slinky analogy. Um, remember proteins are like uh, a slinky in that if they lose their shape, they lose their function. Well, enzymes we just talked are um, protein. They're not completely protein, but the protein part of an enzyme, if it loses its shape, it, it loses its function. And the two things that can make a protein lose its shape and function are temperature and pH, okay? Looking at the graphs here at the bottom, we have uh, on the left side, a graph measuring temperature. And then on the y-axis, we're looking at the rate of reaction. So it's, in other words, basically the higher up on the graph you go, the more effective enzymes are, okay? Well, if you draw an arrow up from about 37 degrees Celsius, which is about normal body temperature, it's actually going to hit right about here in the graph. There's almost that peak point where enzymes are most effective. Okay. Well, if you actually heat an enzyme up a little bit, like what happens when we exercise, just a couple of degrees actually makes them work better. Okay. But if you heat them up too much, Look what happens. It's a very drastic drop off. And the same thing can be said if we cool the body off too much, the enzymes lose their shape and then they no longer function. Okay. Looking at the right side here, this graph is showing you that various enzymes like pepsin and trypsin are adapted for working at specific particular pHs. Okay. Pepsin is an enzyme that's active in our stomach. And we learned the other day that the acidity level in our stomach is very uh, strong. It has a pH, you know, around two. Well, look at the graph. Pepsin works at that low pH. Trypsin is a different enzyme. It works in our small intestine. And the small intestine, as you can see, has an environment much higher. Actually, it's a basic environment above seven. And that's where trypsin is going to work the best. Okay. Any pH above or below that, whether it's here or here, is going to result in the same thing as what we talked about here, over here. It doesn't work because it starts to denature. Okay. Other things that influence the activity of an enzyme would be the concentration of those cofactors and coenzymes, which remember those are the other parts of a uh, enzyme. The concentration of the enzyme itself and the substrate molecules, in other words, the, the substances being acted upon. And then number four, the stimulatory and inhibitory effects by non-substrate chemical substances that can selectively bind to the enzyme and alter its activity. Kind of a wonky sounding sentence, but basically this describes how some medicines work. Um, some pharmacological drugs actually can act like a substrate and that they're like, uh, you ever heard of like a skeleton key, which is a key that, you know, they say is universal and can go into any lock. Well, some uh, medicines actually can bond with a enzyme and act like the natural substrate our body already you know, would naturally have. Okay? And then when that occurs, that results in the, the production of or the uh, formation of something that's going to be physiologically beneficial. And that's why we take that medicine. Okay? Now, in some cases, substrates can uh, be blocked from binding to the enzyme by way of drugs. So it's it's um, kind of unique in how that can work where sometimes we want to um, stimulate, sometimes we want to inhibit. So not the only way that medicines work, but it's one of the ways. Okay, our final category of our organic compounds, the most complex structurally are the nucleic acids. The biggest, the hugest, hugest is not a word, but most huge 
Um, they contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and even phosphorus. So they've got five major uh, elements. They are can, uh, key molecules for human survival. And that's because they provide the directions for building our proteins. There are two varieties of nucleic acids that exist. Deoxyribonucleic acid, which is abbreviated DNA. I'm sure you've all heard of that before. And ribonucleic acid, which is abbreviated RNA. And we can describe DNA as forming the genetic material inside each human cell. And we'll talk more about um, these things called genes in our next lecture, but they're segments of DNA that code for traits we inherit by controlling protein synthesis throughout our lives. So like this morning in anatomy, we were talking about skin color and hair color, and that's a product of melanin. Melanin is a protein. Okay? Well, the type of melanin and how much melanin we produce is a result of the specific genes, which are the segments of our DNA that we inherit from our mom and dad. Okay, And that's why, you know, if uh, both parents have a similar skin color, you're probably gonna have that same skin color. If you have one parent that's really dark complected and one that's very fair complected, you're probably gonna be somewhere in the middle. And I say probably, it's not always 100% accurate that way, but um, it's more often than not the, the case, okay? So that's what DNA is. RNA, I always just tell students to think of it like DNA's cousin, it's nucleic acid. It's a nucleic acid that relays the instructions from genes to guide each cell synthesis of proteins from amino acids. So DNA has the instructions and then it tells RNA what to do. And then RNA is the structure that actually, or is the chemical that results in the production of proteins. And we'll talk all about this in our next lecture. And, but that's why these are important because remember everything that's happening almost anyway in our body is being done by a protein. Well, to get proteins, we have to have these two molecules. Uh, nucleic acids are composed of chains of repeating monomers known as a nucleotide. So a nucleotide is described as the building block of a, uh, whether it's DNA or RNA molecule, here's what a nucleotide looks like. It's got three components, a nitrogenous base, um, which is right here, nitrogenous base is called that because it's got nitrogen in it. There's actually um, five different nitrogenous bases, as you can see there, cytosine, thymine, uracil, adenine, and guanine. Okay. Then you've got a five carbon or pentose sugar, and that's the D or the R for the DNA RNA. Deoxyribose is the five carbon sugar that's in DNA. Ribose is what's in RNA. Okay. And then attached on the other side of that sugar is a phosphate group, okay? So those are the three components that make up one building block. And when put together, this is showing you an illustration of DNA, okay? Which if you're not familiar of, is a double helix, meaning and there's two strands. And you can kind of think of DNA like a ladder, okay? Where you've got, you know, the vertical bars to your ladder and then the rungs, the parts that you step on. Okay, and purple and in blue, which we call uh, the kind of backbone of the DNA, is that that's where you're going to find the sugar phosphate. In fact, it's just like a sugar phosphate backbone. Okay, and then in the middle, the rungs, like what you step on in a ladder, that's where you find those nitrogenous bases. In the case of DNA, there's adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Okay. It's a double strand and one strand runs in one direction, one strand runs in the opposite direction, but those are connected. And you can see the little dots in here. Those dotted lines represent hydrogen bonds. There's two hydrogen bonds that exist between adenine and thymine. There's three that exist between cytosine and guanine. And that's why DNA coils like it does in a helix. So it's not like a ladder and that it's straight up and down. It's more like a spiraled ladder, kind of like a spiral staircase, I guess, if you want to think of it visually like that. And this is all stuff I'm not, you know, going to get into in great detail, more than just me mentioning it, because that's more biology class than in physiology. 
All right, one last organic compound to talk about, kind of as a hybrid, and that's ATP. And as we've mentioned several times already this semester, short for adenosine triphosphate, a very important molecule composed of some of the things we just talked about. In fact, it includes adenine. That's one of those nitrogen spaces that we just talked about. It contains ribose, the same um, five carbon sugar that's in RNA. And then it's, instead of got one phosphate, it's got three phosphates, okay? Three phosphates are at the tail end of it. That's why we call it ATP, triphosphate, okay? Well, if I was to, let me do it real quick, but all the way back to this slide, we talked a little bit about a phosphate, okay? A phosphate is one of those functional groups. In the case of ATP, there's three of these, okay? Well, each phosphate has multiple negative charges, okay? So there's a whole bunch of negativity at the very end of an ATP molecule, okay? So thinking back to our last lecture, we said that opposites attract, okay? Well, when you have like charges instead of opposite charges, they repel. They don't like each other at all. Okay. If you've ever dealt with like magnets, okay, um, and you know you take two magnets and you try to stick them together and you can feel them kind of pushing away from one another, that's what happens with these three phosphates. If you can kind of see right here and here, the bond there there's draw drawing has a little flex to it. Okay? It's got a little bend in it because it's a, a really stressed bond. Okay. Um, so you guys know I love analogies already. I've been talking about some. Uh, I grew up, I'm one of four kids, and um, we had a big old boat of a vehicle when I grew up um, before we got a minivan. Um, but I was the third out of the four of us. So in many cases, I was in the back seat sitting between my big brother and my big sister. And if you have siblings or if you have children, you understand um, how volatile that can be where you've got a whole bunch of friction between all the kids in the in the back seat. In the case of us, you know, I was always fighting with both my siblings on both sides of me. That's kind of what happens with these three phosphates, okay? So there's a lot of stored up energy in this, especially the third phosphate, which can then be transferred by breaking that bond, which is then going to transfer that energy to power several different types of activities, okay? Things like muscular contractions, really, really involves ATP, movement of chromosomes during cell division, movement of structures just inside the cell, um, transport across plasma membranes. We're gonna talk about that in the next lecture. And then as we learned in our previous lecture, remember we said that uh, a catabolic reaction powers an anabolic reaction. Okay, so synthesis reactions, anabolic reactions, building things up requires ATP. And now when that third phosphate is transferred to that, and that energy is transferred, we then go from ATP to ADP, to adenosine diphosphate. We've seen that already before. Now, how do we produce ATP? Well, we add that phosphate that was just removed back to it, and that's what will yield ATP, and the process known as cellular respiration, it's a fancy way to describe how we make our ATP. It involves two phases, what we call the anaerobic phase and the aerobic phase. The anaerobic phase really doesn't get us a whole lot of ATP, just a couple of ATP, um, but the key here is that allows us to make ATP without the use and without the need of oxygen, okay? Whereas the aerobic phase, which is much more plentiful and yields a heck of a lot more ATP, it does require the use of oxygen for that to occur. And that's why we breathe, to get oxygen to our mitochondria so that we can perform aerobic respiration. Now, later on the semester, we're gonna talk about, and it's much later in the semester, we're gonna talk about all these steps, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. We'll even talk about what fermentation is which yields lactic acid. We'll just kind of keep it um, simple for now, knowing what anaerobic and aerobic mean is what we'll kind of focus on.
you'll see these words anaerobic, aerobic quite a bit this semester. So make sure whenever you see anaerobic, you know that's without the use of oxygen. Aerobic means that we are using oxygen. Okay, any questions on biochem? Okay, 